All right, so it's New Year's Eve, and uh, I know generally New Year's Eve is a, is, a, is a positive thing, isn't it? People think about the new goals that they're going to set and the new accomplishments they're going to do in the new year. Um, I want to sort of give you a different perspective and sort of what I think about every time a new year comes around. And, and really what's going through my mind every time a new year comes around is just how quick life is going, right? And I'm sure, you know, last year you probably made the statement, I can't believe it's 2017. And probably when January 1st came around this year, you made the same statement, I can't believe it's 2018, because life just goes so quick, doesn't it? Truly it does. And I, that's what I want us to reflect on today as we go into the new year. Um, I know most people, like I said, they are just setting goals. And often people are just setting goals on things that they want to accomplish. And, and, and I think there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with setting goals, right? And obviously setting goals is good and having goals to hit. But we always want it in the perspective of eternity, right? The perspective of eternity. When we set goals, the question is to what end? So the title of my sermon today is The Day of Death because what I want to remind you all today is that one day we will die and that, de and that, and that day will come quicker than we think. And when we set our goals, hopefully that motivates us to actually get moving, realizing that we don't have as much time as we do. So um, I know a grim, a grim outlook, but... I think it turns into a positive because look at what the Bible says. This is where I get uh, the title of my sermon from, from Ecclesiastes 7. It says, A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. Now, obviously, Ecclesiastes is, is, is a book where it's, you know, a, a lot of the perspective is if, we, uh, if there is no God, right? But at the, at the same time, there's a lot of truth in here because... Even for us, the day of our death is better than the day of our birth. Because you think about it, the day of your birth, you're born into a sinful world, right? Where you've got a lot of struggle, a lot of pain, a lot of sorrow. But then, like Paul says, you know, to die is gain for him. Because when you die, you actually get, obviously, if you're a believer, right? If you're not a believer, then, you know, the day of death is not better. So a good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of one's birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting for that is the end of all men. You see, nobody escapes death. You know, they say there's, there's two things that are sure in this world, death and taxes. And I'm sure there's other things that people say that are sure in this world. But, you know, I'm sure there are ways that people can avoid taxes, like, you know, the rich and the billionaires and the elites. They, they probably don't pay taxes, right? They're the ones collecting and manipulating the money supply. But death for sure is certain, right? Anyone that is alive will one, anyone that is born will one day die. And it says here, it's the end of all men. So why is it better to go to the house of mourning? Where is the house of mourning? It's like going to a funeral. You know, different people have different passages that they think of when they go to a funeral. But this is the passage I always think of when somebody passes away. When somebody, like when somebody invites me to a funeral and I'm going to a funeral. I even spoke at my grandmother's funeral. Um, and she was a Buddhist, right? So it's not that I was up there just telling everybody that she's in hell. But what, what I did was I was just sharing this verse with them and, and, and talking about and just hopefully prompting them in the gentlest way possible at a Buddhist funeral um, for people to think about things of eternity at the very least. You know, when you're at a funeral, you think and you reflect on your own life, right? That's why it's, it, that's why it's important that we think about our death. We think about that our life will end one day because even when you go to a funeral and you see that person in the coffin or you see their picture, what do you think to yourself? You think one day that's going to be me. And you hear people talking about the accomplishments of that person's life and you reflect on what am I doing with my life? You know, what's the legacy I'm leaving? What am I doing for the Lord? How am I spending my life? And this is what Ecclesiastes 7 is saying. That's why he's saying it's better to go to the house of mourning because that's the end of all men. That death happens to everybody. And it says here, and the living will lay it to his heart. 
So that's why it's important for us to think about the fact that our life will end one day because you will consider that and it'll, you'll lay it in your heart and then it'll, you'll reflect on that and, and, and it will change your perspective of life and change your perspective of the world. And it'll obviously change your priorities sometimes and decisions that you make. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. That's a great verse to explain, you know, why God allows suffering, right? God is explaining to us here that sorrow is better because through sadness the count, the, of the countenance, the heart is made better. You know, we're made stronger through suffering. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. So you see, a wise person thinks about death thinks about the, the day he, he, his life will end one day. But the heart of fools, they're the people that don't want to think about death, right? You know, you talk to people, you say, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? Oh, I don't want to think about that. The Bible's saying these people are foolish. This is the sort of fool that just wants to enjoy things. His heart is in the, in the house of mirth. But the wise man considers this because he lays it to his heart and he thinks about how his life, what, he, what he's going to do with his life. So when I think about New Year's, that's why I, I you know, people are setting goals and, and, and that's great. But one thing I want to think you to think about is to what end? You know, what's the purpose of all these goals that you're setting? And, you know, as the years roll around, I just think, oh man, like life's just going so quick. Another year's gone, another year's gone. Kind of like how Luke prayed. And I think if we really focus on this and we think about it, it'll change your priorities, right? Because you, you have this short life and, and how are you going to spend it? Um, you know, one, one for, let me give you a practical example, right? Like somebody might, you know, uh, on, uh, on New Year's, they might be thinking, oh, you know what, you know, next year I want to, I want to do more traveling, you know, I want to see more of the world. And like, I haven't experienced Amsterdam and I haven't experienced, I don't know all these different places. Like, you know, I always think a cool place to experience would be Japan, you know, not, not because of all the filth and stuff that's there, but to go there and try all the different sushis and see all the, the different, you know, I'm sure that, you know, you, you could, you could, you could feel a lifetime of vain things of just enjoyment and pleasure, right? But is that what our life is meant to be about? Right? So, some, so some people, they make goals like that where they want to see the world, they want to go travel, and then what happens? They use up all their annual leave going on traveling, and then you have an event like the Sunshine Coast Soul Winning Marathon where we're planning a church, and maybe you don't have the leave to go on that because you didn't set the priorities right. You didn't think, what, what really should your life be about? And you've set time aside and used your annual leave on something that is not as valuable, doesn't have as much eternal value. But I'm sure that happens a lot with people where they use their annual leave to maybe go on a holiday or maybe use your annual leave to go here or go there, you know, travel to watch the World Cup here and the football cup there, you know, and everything. And then when, when church has a camp or church has some event going on, there's no more annual leave left, right? Because why? It's been prioritized for something that's not as important. 2 Corinthians 4.18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So the things that we see, anything that you can see is temporary, right? But the things that we can't see, like the soul, we can't see the soul, right? Because that's eternal, but we can see somebody's body, right? But that's going to be temporary. There are things that we can hear, right? We can hear somebody's spirit. Right? We can hear certain things, but we don't see them. If we see them, they're temporary. If we don't see them, they're eternal. And see, thinking on death makes us consider the things that are eternal. Like I said, when you go to a funeral, you think about the things you can't see, right? You think about life after death. You think about what are you doing for the kingdom of God. And that's why it's important to be reminded. Look at what it says here in Ecclesiastes 2. See, everybody will die. Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly as far as light excelleth darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head. And you kind of think like, well, where else, where else can your eyes be, right? The wise man's eyes are in his head. But the fool walketh in darkness, and I myself perceive also that one event happeneth to them all. So he's talking about death. So what I, what I gather from when it says the wise man's eyes are in his head, what I get from that is the wise man actually has his eyes open. You know, he's actually using his eyes. He's actually like observing the world and thinking about how things are, whereas the fool's not. It's like the fool's not using his eyes. He's walking in darkness because maybe he's got his eyes closed or whatnot. 
For I myself perceive also that one event happeneth to them all. Then said I in my heart, as it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart that this also is vanity. So like I said, Ecclesiastes is written in the perspective that if, there's, if there is no life after death, right? That's why he's talking about vanity of vanities, all is vanity. I can't remember who said that to me recently. Somebody said that to me recently and they said, you know, they said vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And I'm like, well, no, no, it's, it, it, it's not that, it was a, as I said, it's not that everything, it's not that everything is vain. It's because it's, he's saying this in the perspective that if there's no afterlife, if there's no God, then everything is vain, right? But that's why he concludes in Ecclesiastes 12, you know, let us fear God and keep his commandments, because that's what makes it things not vain if we serve God. But what I'm showing you here is that he's realizing here that ev everybody dies. You know, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're wise, whether you're foolish, you know, he says here, one thing happens to them all. One event happeneth to them all. Then said I in my heart, as it happeneth to the fool, so like the, the, the foolish person, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I then more wise, right? If there's nothing after this, like, what's the difference? Why, why be wise if we're all just going to die? Then I said in my heart, this also is vanity. For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever, right? So yeah, you might, you might be remembered for a few generations, but eventually people forget about you, right? Seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how dieth the wise man? as the fool. So as, unless you live to see the coming of Jesus Christ, you know, you will experience physical death. I mean, that's just a fact, right? I don't have to really beat that horse. Second point is life is short. And this is, I know this is nothing new to you guys, but what this, the purpose of this sermon is not to teach you something new, but just to remind you as you reflect on the new year, think about the fact that yes, one day you'll die, but also that day is closer than you think. And if we don't think about these things, often we put things off, right? We procrastinate or due to fear or whatnot, we won't take certain risks. But with life is so short, you kind of think, well, what have you got to lose? You know, your time is ticking. Sometimes you've got to take these calculated, I'm not saying just take foolish risks, like, but take calculated and wise risks. Well, you may not know the outcome, but, you know, you've only got one life to live. You know, one life to live. You, you may as well sometimes take the chance and do something that has a bit of risk. James 4, go to now ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. So these are people talking about all the plans they have in the coming years and all the businesses they're going to do and all the, and all the money that they're, they're going to make. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. So you don't even know whether you will wake up tomorrow, but these people are boasting about the things they're going to do in the future and all the things that they're going to do. Now, one thing to note here is it's not rebuking responsible planning, right? Obviously, the Bible talks about the ant, you know, laying up, uh, you know, in the winter, the food and the slug, it is not doing anything. What it's talking about here, and what it's, what it's rebuking is people that are boasting in all these things that they are going to accomplish, as opposed to just being responsible, right? And saying, hey, these are all the things they're going to do, as opposed to having the mindset of, hey, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. So it's, hey, it's still, you know, trusting that God will even allow you to live to that point to fulfill those plans, as opposed to boasting about all the things that you're going to accomplish. Whereas you, not, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, so tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth. Away. Just think about that for a little bit. The Bible is saying that our life is like a vapor. So it's like when you see the steam coming out of the kettle, it just comes and it goes like a flash in the pan. And the Bible is saying your life is like that. And it might not feel like that at some, t at some times, but just think about the past, like how quick it's gone. Like, you know, I, you know, Alex and I was, were talking and he was saying, you know, he remembers even when Simon was, he was saying when Simon was young. And, you know, it doesn't even feel like that long ago that, you know, I remember Simon being born and things like that. And, and, and life is already going so quick. He's already in year one and he's already, you know, getting a personality of his own. Yeah, life, life truly is that quick, you know. And I think when we think about what you want to accomplish in the new year and what you want to do in the new year, you know, how much longer are you going to put it off? 
You know, maybe there are things that you want to do. Like, are you going to keep putting it off until you have no life left to even accomplish these things for the Lord? So I just think that's a powerful image there, that our life is likened to a vapour that comes and goes. And, and compared to eternity, that is how quick it is. You know, that's, that's how quick our life is. You know, how are you spending your life? How, how are you spending it? Are you, are you wasting it? Uh, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. And this sort of lines up with Proverbs 27.1 where it says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. And like I said, it's, it's not that you shouldn't be planning ahead and being responsible, but it's just saying that confidence that you're going to do all these things and not even knowing that you're even going to live tomorrow, right? Boasting in all these things that you're going to accomplish as opposed to trusting that the Lord will even give you the time to accomplish them. Uh, let's look at Psalms 90 verse 10. In Psalms 90 verse 10, it says, The days of our years are three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet is their strength labor and, uh, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. So the Bible gives us an average lifespan, right, that, that of man. It says a, a score is 20 years, so it's saying it's about 70 to 80 years. Right? Now, some people live longer than that. Some people live shorter than that. And, and you often, you, you know, what gets me thinking is, well, I'm turning 32 soon. I mean, how much time do I have left? The 32 years already went so quick. I mean, how much time do I really have left if the average lifespan is 30 to 40 years? Uh, sorry, uh, 70 to 80 years. A lot of us, you know, are already more than halfway past that. How much time do we have left? Ecclesiastes 9. This is a great passage because I think, you know, this is a bit of encouragement to people that feel that, you know, they draw the short straw in life, right? Ecclesiastes 9, it says here, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill. But time and chance happeneth to them all. Right, so he's saying here that it's, it, it, what, what, what Solomon is saying here. Sometimes he didn't see that it's always the strongest that win the race, or it's not always the wisest that win, and it's not always. Like you say, it's not even. It's not always that the men of understanding are the ones that make money, and it's not the ones that are skillful that get favor. But it's just time and chance happen to them all. That everybody gets an opportunity, and whether it's not whether or not they take the chance. And what I want you to think about today is because life is so short and you're going to die one day, maybe there are things you want to do for the Lord, great things for the Lord, or things you want to accomplish in life to further your effectiveness and ability for the Lord. Why, why are you holding back? You know, like it's just, it's not that you have to be any much stronger or wiser or more skillful. Sometimes you just need to take the chance. It says here in Ecclesiastes 9, 12, For man also knoweth not his time. Right? Talking about you don't know when you're going to die. Right? So are you going to wait and wait, thinking that maybe you've got another 20 years? Well, maybe you don't have that much time. Right? Because you don't know when you're going to die. As the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time, when it falleth suddenly upon them. So knowing that life is short, right? Sometimes it's, it's, it's wise to take chances, like take wise chances, right? Not, not saying that you're doing something foolish, but you know, you've thought about it. It's like an educated, uh, educated choice, but sometimes you just don't know the outcome, right? It's like when people start a business, right? You might start a business, but if you, if you didn't really think it through and you, you, know, you just say, I want to do something and you haven't really done it responsibly, then that's a, taking a chance unwisely. But wisely is, you know, you, you've, you've thought about it, you've planned it out, and you've organized it, and, but you don't know whether this business is going to succeed. But then you do it anyway, right? Why, why, why not? Right? You've only got so much time to live, and, you know, you may not get another chance. There might be an opportunity that comes. There might be a certain business opportunity that you take. You don't know the outcome. I mean, 
I can think, you know, I, I haven't done anything sort of like large financially like that, but you know, there are times in my life where I've taken chances, right? Like, you know, like even when I moved to Phoenix, I didn't know what the outcome was, but like I said, it wasn't like, it wasn't the sort of uh, opportunity where you're just like, oh, I just want to travel and go. No, no, I had God at the forefront of my mind. I knew there was a church that I wanted to visit there and I wanted to serve God there, but I didn't know what, what was going to happen with my life. I didn't know what job I was going to get there, so I didn't know all the dots that were going to be connected, but I took that chance because I was thinking, well, I only live once, right? And, 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 and this is something that I, uh, I believed that was the right thing to do at the time, so I took that chance. Um, even when, you know, I, I met Elizabeth, right? Like uh, there are times when, you know, like there, there are single people here. Like sometimes there's that girl and you, you want to take a chance or you're a bit scared whether or not to approach her. But remember, you only live once and life is so short. Sometimes it's just worth taking that chance and saying hello, you know, and, and, and you know, yeah, you might get rejected, but, you know, if, if you get rejected, if you don't do anything, it's a no anyway, right? So um, a lot of people, and, and Elizabeth and I were talking about this last night, like a lot of people thought that, you know, after I met Elizabeth, you know, we got married, you know, after a couple of weeks and they thought it was really quick. But... That's why I'm saying there's a difference between making an unwise chance and taking a wise chance in the sense that, you know, you, you, you know, it's not that when I met Elizabeth, I had not thought about these things, right? I had thought about the sort of woman I was looking for. I had thought about what sort of future that we were going to have, how we were going to approach it, the things we were going to talk about. And when I met her, those are the things I put into place. And it just happened to, to, to go according to plan. And then we ended up getting married. So I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not saying that you do things that are unwise. I think you guys get my point, right? I'm not saying that you just do things that are foolish, but sometimes you don't know the outcome. You're like, you can't, you know, we don't have 20, 20 vision when we look into the future, but don't let that fear stop you from sometimes taking a chance on things and, 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 and doing something that's a little bit out of the box because at the end of the day, life is so short, right? And sometimes these, these times and these chances happen and if you don't take the chance, you might miss out on a once in a lifetime opportunity. I remember when I, when I was, uh, we were, when I met, after I met Elizabeth and before we, got, we had gotten married, uh, we were going soul winning and we were talking about the future together. And I, me I remember saying, you know, I know for some people it's like, a, a, it's a really big decision, obviously, who you are to marry. And I know there's all these different decisions that need to be made. But I remember reflecting on it with her and saying, well, you know what, but even if, um, you know, even, even if, uh, you know, we're, we're making a quick decision kind of thing, at the end of the day, life is so short. You know, and, and I said to her at the time, you know, I'm sure, you know, we're going to look back at these days and just, you know, we're going to be celebrating our 50th anniversary and just think, where did all the time go? You know, even though we, we got married so quickly. And, and it's already sort of feeling like that in the sense that time is going really quick where, you know, when, when, I, when I thought at the time thinking, you know, being married for, for seven years, there's so much in the future, but, you know, where did the seven years go? I and mean, I can even think about, I, I can still remember like living in Mexico, right? And I, I can still picture myself being in that house that we were living in, giving birth to Simon, like it was only a couple of weeks ago. But yeah, you know, now here's Simon. He's, he's, you know, he's almost seven years old now. So I think you get my point. I right? like life's just going so quick. And, um, you know, even when I, I, when I was learning a lot of different sales strategies and things like that, one thing they would always say when they talk about, you know, taking that opportunity, they'd say, you know, if not now, when, right? And if not this, what? And if not you, who? It's kind of like, well, you know, how long? It's sort of saying, how, how much longer are you going to wait to, to take a chance on something? Proverbs 29, 25. This is often the thing that stops us from taking a chance, right? Is fear. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Fear often stops us from doing a lot of things, right? And we already talked about singles. You know, often it's fear you know, of, of approaching, fear of rejection, right? Of, of somebody that, approaching somebody you're interested in. Sometimes couples will put off having children, right? Because of, of fear of what it's like to be parents, or fear of being good parents, or fear of being able to provide for these children. But... You know, like it's, it's, it's not really that much time, you know. There's only so many children that you can have in your life. Like why, why put these things off? Um, 
You know, what about a job or a career? We talked about that, right? Like people have fear of being unsuccessful or fear of being rejected when, you know, uh, trying to go for another job or things like that. What about when it comes to spiritual things, right? People put off soul winning, right? They say, well, I'll do soul winning next year when I'm more prepared. But generally it's because of fear. It's fear of people. And then when people actually do come out soul winning, they realize that there's nothing to be fearful of. The people, the people at the door are more fearful of us, right, than, than, than we are of them. Like we, we think, oh, you know, that we're so scared of them. That they're the ones that don't want to talk to us once for them they see that we're holding a Bible. It's a bit like insects, right? And it's, it's funny because I hate spiders and I'm still scared of cockroaches and things like that. But it's, they're probably more scared of us. You know, they're more scared of us than we are of them. Uh, it's the same with preaching. You know, like with public speaking, you know, there are some of you in here that, you know, you have a desire to preach. You have a desire to preach one day. You know, how much longer are you going to put it off? Are you putting it off just out of fear? But then are you put, you know, what's there to be fearful of? You only live such a short time, you know, why, why put it off? And it's the same with any sort of ministry, right? Like fear of what people might think about you and things like that. And, you know, I'm not saying that I'm perfect, right? I'm not perfect. I obviously struggle with these fears as well. And, you know, I hesitate. So, I, you know, I need this sort of sermon as much as you guys do to be reminded about how short life is and to take these chances because oftentimes I find myself playing it safe as well as opposed to taking these risks um, in terms of serving God and putting yourself out there uh, without having a fear of man. Because, you know, if you just play it safe your whole life, you might just play it safe all the way to the grave and accomplish nothing in your life. And, you know, some people might say, but you say, you know, but some people might say, you know, but I am accomplishing things, right? Because there, there are people out there that are taking risks. They are accomplishing things. They are doing, I guess, exciting things. And this is what I want you to think about now. So our, all of us will die Life is short, but what I want you to reflect on now is how will you spend it? Because you're right, there are people out there that are doing really exciting things. You know, they're seeing the world and, you know, you, wa you watch those videos, you know, you watch those videos on Facebook, you're like scrolling through and there's like this first person footage of this guy just on a bike, just like riding down like this mountainside and things like that. So there are people that do these crazy things and they have this mentality of, well, life is so short. Why don't we do things that are exciting, do things that, you know, are a little bit risky, but then they live life, you know, to the fullest. But just because there are things that you can fill your life with, that doesn't mean those are the things we want to fill our life with, right? Because we want to fill our life with things that actually have eternal value, not just trying to make our life as full as possible. But we need to think about when we spend our life, when we take that chance, how is it going to benefit the kingdom of God? Second Peter 3, verse 9, it says here, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Right? So that's God's desire that everyone would be saved. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. So what is this talking about? This that one day, not only will your not only one day will your life end, but one day the world will end, right? There will be no more heaven and no more earth when he makes a new heaven and new earth. But look at this in verse 11. It says here, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? So this is why today I want you guys thinking about death, right? I want you guys thinking about the fact that your life is going to end because knowing one day it's going to end, just like here, knowing that one day the world is going to end, it's getting us to reflect here and say, well, how then should you live your life? What manner of persons ought ye to be in holy conversation and godliness? And it answers that in verse 12, saying, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens. See, we've got our heart on eternal things and on heavenly things and in the next life, right? And a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace 
without spot or blameless. See, so yes, we set these goals, right? Our life is short. We take these chances, but then at the end, what's the end game of all these goals? What should be the goal of our goals, right? And the goal is obviously to glorify God. John 15, 8, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. So you want to aim to be more productive for Jesus. You know, yeah, maybe some, some people want to start a business, but why do you want to make all that money? You know, it's not wrong to make money, but why do you need to make money? So we need to think about why do we do all these things? Ultimately, these things need to come back to how are we furthering the kingdom of God? You know, are we doing these things to improve ourselves, to make ourselves more efficient, make ourselves more productive? Are we making more money so we have more money to give? Those sort of things, right? There are many parts to a machine, right? There's many parts to a church. We're like a machine and we all have to play our part. And when we play our part, we will be more salt and more light. Let's look at these passages here. Matthew 6. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and, moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So when the Bible says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, right? That's physical treasures, right? That's physical material wealth and whatnot. But when it says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, how does somebody do that? Right? Like, how do you, how do you lay up treasures in heaven instead of laying up treasures on earth? Right? What are the, tre what are the treasures in heaven? It's not, like you, it's not that you withdraw your money out of an earthly bank account and then you deposited it into a heavenly bank account that you can only access when you go to heaven. That's not what it's talking about, right? So what is it? When you lay up treasures upon earth and you're laying up treasures in heaven, how do you do this, right? Now, when you pay into your heavenly savings account, right, you can, you can either do it with money or you do it with time, right? That's really the only two things you can give to God. You either give of your material wealth or you give of your time. But you know what people say? People say time is money, right? Because your, your money is basically a value that you've put on the time that you've put into making that money, right? So it's, it's the, sort of the economic potential of the time that you've invested. So really, it's, it's really just time or money, right? But at the end of the day, when you are laying up treasures in heaven, it's pretty much what are you giving to God in order to win more souls? And, and what about the time, the, the, the actual winning of the souls yourself? So you either give time by actually going out and winning souls or taking part in soul winning, or you may give to ministries that are winning souls. That is another way that you can lay up treasures in heaven rather than laying up your treasures on earth. It's, it's how are you using your money to further the kingdom. And this is actually talked about in 1 Timothy 6, because really, you know, we often think of ourselves as poor, right? We think of ourselves as, you know, uh, you know we're, not, we don't, we're not as rich as, you know, Bill Gates, or we don't, we don't have millions and millions of dollars or whatnot. But to the majority of the world, we are rich. We are extremely rich. Like, we do not think about where our food comes from. We have ample clothing. We have ample shelter. We don't worry about, you know, whether or not we've got air conditioning or a car that works. I mean, we, are a very, we live in a very prosperous um, situation. So this passage applies to us, doesn't it? It doesn't just apply to people that are multimillionaires. But it says here, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, right? Just basically proud of what they've accomplished. Nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. So it's not that there, that there isn't a place to enjoy the things that God has given us. Even in Ecclesiastes, it talks about those things. But look at what it says here in verse 18. That they do good. So this is what Paul wants Timothy to charge those that are rich in this world that they do good, right? So they're actually doing good works, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute. So yes, it's, there's nothing wrong with making money, but the question is, how tightly are you holding on to these things? Are you willing to lay up treasures in heaven and, and, and not lay up treasures in earth to give to God's work in any way, shape or form, as well as your time? 
willing to communicate. So distribute is giving it out, communicating is, is sending it off to other people. It's very similar. I think the difference is distributing it is like within their own church, I think, like distributing amongst their own church and then communicating is sending it off to another church. Now look at this, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So there's again that, that, that phrase of laying up in store, laying up treasures in heaven. It's about converting your material wealth and your time into things that are going to be in heaven. So like I said, it's not wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong to make lots of money or to have lots of money, right? Because some people have lots of money and they use that to make even more money, right? But then the question is, what do you then do with those profits? Because a lot of people have money, make money, use that money to make more money so that they can just enjoy it, right? And this is what we see here in Luke 12. And, and it's just interesting how this all lines up in Luke 12, where the laying up treasures in heaven is likened to this parable of this, this, this foolish rich man. Luke 12, it says here, And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And I think that's something that we often need to reflect on, right? Because when we live in this physical world, often we get caught up in trying to lay up riches here and putting our trust in these riches. And sometimes we have to read this parable of this rich man and be reminded that Jesus says, hey, your life is not about the things that you possess, right? Your life is not about the abundance that you can hoard in this life. It's about looking to the next life and laying up your treasures in heaven. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits, right? And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. So that's sort of like somebody saying, hey, I've just made all this money. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to take this money and invest it into something even bigger and make even more money, right? And, and you know, he's going to just keep building so we can store more of these, these riches. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Right? So this is how he spent his life, right? And he's, see, he's laid up all these riches to serve himself because he's talking to himself saying, Soul, thou hast much la goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. So yes, this, this fool here, this rich fool here, yes, he did take a chance, right? He, he spent his life taking that chance, making that money, but to what end? To the end that he would just serve himself and this is where the Bible is saying, you're a fool. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? Look at this. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Right? See, so it's laying treasures on earth rather than laying up these treasures on heaven. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for your body, what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. So again here, it's not saying that you shouldn't be responsible. It's saying here, take no thought is saying that we shouldn't worry about these things, right? If, we are, if you're a godly Christian, you'll be working hard. You're going to have enough to eat. You're going to have a job and things like that. It's people that are slack, right, that are, that are living in sin and being sinful. They're the ones that are not being taken care of. But if you just live you know, a Christian life, uh, you know, hard-working life, you're always going to have something to eat. You're, you know, you're not going to be on the street and whatnot. Uh, he's saying, hey, don't you have to worry about having clothes and having food. Um, the life is more than meat and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? Of which, and which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, neither do, uh, not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into, into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, ye of little faith? And seek not ye, and seek not ye what ye shall eat, 
or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind, for all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But look at this, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And I wanted to get to this, sell that ye have, and give alms. So you see here where he's talking about not laying up treasures on earth and laying up treasures on heaven. So he is distributing, right? Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So just seeing again, because we can compare this idea of laying up treasures not on earth but laying up treasures in heaven, what is it, right? It's just basically converting your material wealth and your time into things that are profitable to the kingdom of God, right? So to what end are we living our life? You know, what do you value? You know, is it this life or the next? Now, I sort of wanted to finish on these couple of passages because when we talk about laying up treasures in heaven, right? So one is, when, by laying up treasures in heaven, you are basically taking your physical wealth or your time, right, and investing that into things that can be laid up in heaven. But what I want to show you here is, is what are these treasures in heaven? Right, when you lay up treasures in heaven, what is actually getting built in heaven? Is it that you're going to go to heaven and you're going to have all this gold and silver that you didn't spend on earth? You know, they say that the streets of heaven are paved with gold. And you're going to have all eternity. Like if you needed to build riches in heaven, you're going to have all eternity to work and make things, right? So it's not that you're building physical, laying up physical treasures in heaven rather than enjoying them on earth. You know, we're not Muslims, right? Like where Muslims kind of believe, you know, you didn't get to enjoy all this pleasure and all these women on earth. But in heaven, that's when you're going to get it all. You're going to get all the things that you didn't get to enjoy, all the alcohol, and all the drugs and all the feasting and all that sort of stuff. Look at here in uh, 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3 is talking about building on that foundation, right? You know, you know that, uh, that, uh, that passage where it says, you know, Jesus Christ is the foundation and you either build on that foundation gold, silver and precious stones or wood, hay and stubble. And the question is, what are those things? You know, what, what, are, what is the gold, gold, silver and precious stone? What is the wood, hay and stubble? This is what I, I think that they are. Because if we look at the context of this passage, I believe these treasures that we're laying up in heaven, they're people. They're actually souls, right? Because that's the only thing really you can take to heaven, right? We tell people that. What, what are the things that you can take to heaven? You can't take your, your treasures on earth and then when you lay up treasures in heaven, it's because there are more souls in heaven due to the investment you've made in earth. Whether it's money that you've given to ministries that are winning more souls or your own time that you've put in laboring in the vineyard as well. And both of them are necessary. You know, both of us, both of them have a place in our Christian life. But look here in verse, in verse 5. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? So we can already see here the context is getting people saved, right? That, that every man is given somebody by whom they believe, right? In order to hear the gospel. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So what is the increase, right? The increase is that more people are getting saved. More people are believing that we plant seeds, right? We go out like the parable of the sower. We're sowing the seed. And, and the increase is that people hear the word and they get saved, right? And, there's, there's, and, and the more we invest in that, the more treasures we're laying up in heaven. I want to show you that in this passage. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. So you see, we plant, we water, but God is giving the increase by people believing on Jesus Christ and being saved. 1 Corinthians 3, 8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Right? So we're rewarded in he heaven because of the people that we're getting saved, because they're going to be in heaven. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husband, husbandry. Ye are God's building. So you see how there's this idea that we are the temple of God. We are, this built, this, we are the stones in this building that are built upon this foundation. So you see how the stones built on the foundation are people 
It's not just material wealth in heaven. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So that's the foundation, right? Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So what, what, how is our work going to be measured in heaven? Right? Like is our, is our, if, if, we're, if we don't lay up treasures on earth, right, which is a material wealth, is that how it's going to be measured in heaven? No, right? God's not going to look at like how much money you made on earth when he's trying your work. It's going to be how many souls did your work actually affect in the end? You know, when, when, when you're putting gold, silver and precious stones, these are people that are like that you'll help to get saved as opposed to other things that you did that don't, you know, that don't have an eternal value. But the only things that do have eternal value are souls, right? That's the gold, silver and precious stones as opposed to the wood, hay, and stubble, which is just the other things that we fill our life with. But I think there's a parable here, that there's a parallel here as well, in the sense that wood, hay, and stubble, I think also refer to people that, you know, that we hoped were saved, but actually weren't. You know, because I think there are, there are ways, you know, people might be trying to, get people saved, but maybe they don't have the best methods and things like that, and then they, they're not actually being effective in how they are getting people saved and giving them assurance of salvation and whatnot. So I think that there's this parallel here between people that aren't really saved and people that are saved, and I'll, I'll show you that a bit as well. 1 Corinthians 3, If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. And if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So I believe that there is a, 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 an analogy here where th there are people being built on this foundation. And when it gets tried by fire, the people that are left are the ones that are saved, as opposed to the people that aren't really saved. Um, let me show you here in 2 John. This is where I get this, this, get this idea from. In 2 John 1, it talks about here deceivers, right? Deceivers that are entered into the world. And we don't want to lose the things that we have wrought in the sense that we are trying to get people saved. We're trying to get people into the faith, but deceivers are taking them out of the faith. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves, right? That we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds." So I believe that there's this, there's this parallel here where we, you know, basically when we're trying to get people saved and we're trying to get people into church, that we're sort of building on this foundation and trying to add stones to this building. And one day we'll realize, you know, how many people that are actually saved and how many people aren't actually saved and whatnot. And it's the same here where he's saying we want to help people make sure that they're saved. And not in the sense that, you know, you know make sure they're doing works and whatnot like, what like that. But I'm saying there are a lot of people that are in churches, but they're, they're not necessarily believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's saying here that, hey, there's many deceivers entered into the world, that there may be even people amongst us, people that we know, that we think are saved, that aren't actually saved. 
right? And part of our job is to make sure people are saved. You know, we talk to them and, and explain assurance of salvation. Know, they know that they are saved. And that's part of the reason of preaching as well. That's why, you know, sometimes I'll preach about assurance of salvation and how to know that you're saved. Because part of it's this, right? Because part of this is my work. I want to make sure I'm putting on their gold, silver and precious stones as opposed to just getting a bunch of people in church but then at the end of the day, realizing that like half my congregation is not saved, which, is, which can happen in some churches that don't teach doctrine, right? They just get a lot of people there. They just have a lot of people that they've influenced, but a lot of them aren't actually saved. And that's why you want to reflect on your own soul winning method too. Like that's, that's why a lot of people don't like the whole one, two, three, repeat, repeat after me. It's not that, you know, some people, they, they do believe that people can get saved at the door, but then they realize a lot of people, when they go soul winning the Jack Hiles method, they're not being thorough, right? They're not explaining things. They're just getting people to agree to certain things and, and getting a Catholic to pray. But the Catholic is still trusting in Mary, still trusting in their work, not actually believing the right thing, right? This is where how we build makes a difference, right? We want to make sure when we build, we're building things that are solid, things that are going to last for eternity because there's a lot of deceivers out there that are going to, you know, undo a lot of the work that, we, that we've done if we haven't gotten to the point where they're actually saved and they actually understand. So all that to say this, right? Well, Because we're, we're talking about, hey, you know, our life is so short. Life is so quick. Sometimes we ought to just take chances and do things without fear, but to the end that we are actually laying up treasures in heaven. Right? Because you can, yes, you can do a lot of things in your life, laying up treasures on earth, but how is it actually affecting eternity? Are you using your talents, your time, your resources in a way when you set your goals for the new year, how are they actually going to further the kingdom of God so that when you get to heaven, there will be more souls there because of what you've invested in this earth? And I want to just end um, on these two passages here. Hebrews 12, it says here, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. See, because living for God is not easy, right? And that's why it's saying here, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. So obviously we can talk about doing all these great things for God, but it's, it's, it's obviously not as easy as, as, as it sounds, right? And what I want you to, 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 to sort of encourage you here is don't quit, you know, keep going. You know, there might be fear, there might be, uh, you know, things that you don't know in the future, but don't give up, you know, keep going and, and, and keep working at the kingdom of God, trying to get people saved and being effective. So what's the conclusion, right? Last verse I'll show you guys here, Hebrews 9. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So the Bible says here that we all will die once, right? It's sure that we will die. Our life is short. But I think one great thing to reflect on here is that we die once. So that means you only have one life to live. One death, one life. So how are you going to spend it? How are you going to spend your life? And I hope you spend your life, you know, not laying up, tre you know, not laying up treasures in earth, but laying up treasures in heaven. And we know that those treasures in heaven are the people that we're going to win to Christ. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, Lord, we thank you for the reminder that our life truly is short. And um, Lord, you know, maybe it's fear, maybe it's laziness, maybe it's, uh, you know, the cares of this world that are taking us away from remembering the purpose and why we're here. And that's to win souls to you in, and, and investing our money and our time in getting more souls to heaven. 
So I pray, Lord, that as we reflect on the new year, I pray, Lord, that we would think about how we're spending our short life, the one life that we have. And uh, Lord, may we, may we do greater things in the new year. And Lord, may we not put off things that we desire to do just uh, due, due to these different reasons. May we, may we start afresh and, and Lord, um, commit to actually making things happen, taking that chance on great things that we might want to do for you. So we pray, Lord, uh, and ask you to help us. You know, we, we pray that we will accomplish your will on earth as it is in heaven. And uh, pray, Lord, that you would help us to do that. And we pray these things in, in your holy name, in the name of Jesus. Amen.